Okay. Oh, by the way, my digital camera took that picture, but uh, uh, <laughs> uh, cosmic rays are my friend, and they should be your friend also. Uh, this presentation is going to acquaint you with some of the uh, fascinating source of radiation that is literally from beyond the Earth, or actually beyond the stars. Uh, well, it only represents about a third of our radiation expo annual radiation exposure. It's large enough to detect with simple tools like this Geiger counter. This is one of those aware electronics uh, RM60s that, that we've been hearing about. Um, I've got it hooked up to my laptop right now, so the clicking you hear is the detections that we're making with that Geiger counter. So something like a third of those clicks, a third of those clicks are cosmic ray, is, a, is a cosmic ray. Uh, the cosmic rays I'm talking about are, are plentiful enough that on average about one passes to the size of your hand about uh, once every second. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, the history of cosmic rays is not much more than about a century old. It was only in 1896 that Henry Becquerel, the French physicist, discovered that sun elements like uranium emit ionizing radiation. At the time, physicists could only detect radio radioactivity through either photographic film or through electroscopes, uh, similar to this one right here. Since radioactivity was a property of some matter, of, of some types of matter, some types of elements, where radioactivity was discovered or detected meant there had to be radioactive elements nearby, and that's kind of important. Um, but it didn't have to be solid matter. It could be gases like radon gas, which is radioactive. Early in the 20th century, some physicists believed that there was a source of radiation from beyond the Earth, and one of these was Victor Hess. To test his hypothesis, he ascended, ascended on a balloon carrying a type of electroscope to measure background radiation. The electroscope is called an electrometer, so it's a very sensitive electroscope. Hess discovered that for about the first 3,000 feet as he rose off the ground, the radiation levels decreased. Now, if he had stopped there, he would have said, well, I'm getting further away from the Earth. Therefore, my background radiation is decreasing. The source of that radiation has got to be radioactive elements in the Earth. But he continued his experiments, continued uh, continue to rise up higher and higher. And as he got higher, the background counts went up. Uh, he made several trips measuring background radiation, and he ascended as high as 17,000 feet. This was in an open gondola and without a supply of oxygen. Radiation at the highest levels, 17,000 feet that he traveled, were four times greater than they are on the ground. So if it was four counts per minute down here, it would be like 16 counts per minute up at 17,000 feet. He thought that that radiation occurred from or was, was caused by electricity in the air. Now, that was not correct. But he still won the 1936 Nobel Prize for physics for his discovery of a radiation source that was, or for radiation that did not originate from radioactive elements in the crust. Uh, it was, the next person I want to talk to is about Robert Millikan. He's an American physicist, and he was already famous for measuring the charge on the electron. He carried out more research uh, measuring radiation at altitudes to, to understand uh, more about this radiation. Uh, extraterrestrial radiation, so this extraterrestrial radiation, this radiation from beyond the Earth, it, you know, extraterrestrial radiation is not a really suitable name. So in 1925, Millikan gave it the name that we know it by today, cosmic rays. And he believed that cosmic rays were gamma rays. Gamma rays are energetic uh, photons of light. And since we're talking about photons of light, calling them cosmic rays is appropriate. A ray is, 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 a, is a, like a photon of light. Um, later work, though, showed that when you took a cosmic ray and you sent it into a cloud chamber, it actually traveled in a curved path. It travels in a curved path because there's magnets inside of the cloud chamber. Photons of light don't carry charges, so photons of light cannot make that curved path inside the cloud chamber. That indicated to physicists that it's not photons of light that, that are the cosmic rays, but they actually got to be charged chunks of matter. So in reality, when we call them a cosmic ray, that's really a misnomer. It's really not a ray like a photon of light. It's actually solid matter, particles of matter. So we really should be calling them cosmic radiation. But being traditionalists, we just still call them cosmic rays. Uh, by the way, observing cosmic rays in cloud chambers led to the discovery of more subatomic particles. As you go back to the 1920s, particle accelerators could not generate the energies that we use today. So they discovered the positron, the first piece of antimatter was discovered in cosmic rays, as were muons and pions. Uh, so in the, in, back in the 1920s, 1930s, if you were a particle physicist, you weren't going to a particle accelerator to do your work. You were sending balloons out and measuring cosmic rays. 
When a, cosmic, when a subatomic particle on a cosmic ray collides with an atom in the upper atmosphere, it creates a shower of secondary particles. And this is something that, that Pierre Auger, a French physicist, discovered in 1937. The shower divides up the energy of this original primary cosmic ray, creating a shower of secondary, particle, of secondary cosmic rays as it gets closer to the ground. That single cosmic ray may turn into a shower of cosmic rays that may cover a circle about 100 meters across by the time it gets to the ground, or in some cases up to a kilometer across, 10 times larger. The number of particles within the shower and their average energy uh, uh, by Auger to conclude that some cosmic rays carry more than 1 trillion electron volts of energy. And just for a ratio, just kind of an idea of what numbers we're talking about, the photons of light that are entering your eye only have one to two electron volts. So we're talking about a particle of light or a particle, subatomic particle carrying a trillion times more energy than the light entering your eyes. Now the source of cosmic rays was still a mystery. No one knew where they came from. But 60 years ago, Enrico Fermi, who's known for creating the first atomic reactor in Chicago, he hypothesized that these tremendous energies that we find in cosmic rays originated in magnetic fields in interstellar space. Later work extended that to shock waves inside of supernova remnant. And the picture you saw before is a supernova remnant, which is where we believe that a lot of cosmic rays come from. Okay, next slide. Cosmic rays consist of about 50% protons, which are the nuclei of hydrogen atoms. So of those, one of, one of those three clicks, out of every three, one of those clicks, Half of them are actually just protons, or the nuclei of hydrogen atoms. 25% are, are alpha rays, or alpha particles, which are the nuclei of helium atoms. 13% are heavier elements, all the way up to uranium. And a very small percentage, about 1%, consists of electrons and gamma rays. If you look at the number of, of subatomic particles and their abundances, it matches the abundances of the elements that we know that are in the universe. So the ultimate source of cosmic rays has to be familiar objects like stars. Uh, next slide. The way there. An air shower occurs when a single primary cosmic ray, which we've got here, enters into the Earth's atmosphere. It's moving at relativistic speeds, and when it collides with a molecule or an atom, excuse me, atom in the air, it shatters that atom, creating a secondary shower of particles, subatomic particles. These then travel down to the ground, following the same path, and they can collide with other molecules or atoms even further down, creating another shower of particles. Eventually, they lose enough energy that we start losing some of these secondary particles of radiation. So then uh, we can start with a single primary cosmic ray, and by the time it gets to the ground, there can be a thousand, in fact, up to a billion secondary cosmic rays from this original cosmic ray, depending on its energy. But we get our primaries first, collide with an, an atom in the atmosphere, shatter it, create a secondary uh, series of, of our cosmic rays that can hit other, other atoms, creating additional secondaries. Eventually, they get, some of them will get absorbed by the atmosphere, but still, anywhere from a thousand to a billion of them can be created from a single primary cosmic ray. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Now, a Geiger counter lofted on a balloon or rocket can show the cosmic nature of, radi of this radiation. Um, this is a chart from a previous flight. Uh, in fact, the first flight of this year, two flights ago this year. Um, as we increase in altitude, the counts go up, as you can see, until we get to this knee, which occurs around 62,000 feet or so. At that point, we're getting out, we're seeing initially down here, is increasing the amount of secondary cosmic rays. The secondaries, as we get down lower, they're getting wiped out by the atmosphere. But we're seeing more and more secondary cosmic rays until we get to this knee. Now we start, we get into the region where there are fewer secondary cosmic rays because there are more primaries. There are more primary cosmic rays up here that have not hit air molecules, atoms in the atmosphere yet to create those secondary cosmic rays. Now this is with two different Geiger counters. This is the RM60, which is the one we, we've talked about. I've experimented with one uh, made by electronic gold mine using an old Russian Geiger counter tube. And this is the counts I get from it. This one is calibrated. I trust this one. I'm not sure what's all going on here with this, with this Russian built one. 
That's a 30 year old tube, but it still shows that knee and the count decreases. This might be a good Geiger counter for balloon sats for high school students that want to do an experiment. You may not get qualitative or quantitative data, but you may get qualitative data. They can see the knee, but you may not, you may tell them, you know, don't trust the numbers, but look at how it changes. Uh, this is a $150 Geiger counter. This was about an $80 Geiger counter. So I, I, I would find it easier to do this with high school students. Drink. And I think we're going to go to the next slide, please. Now, occasionally something strange happens. In 2009, I set up a Geiger counter, made my measurements, got the knee that I expected, started to decrease, but you can see about 80,000 feet, we started to increase again. This flight was took place in, in the state of Minnesota, which is closer to the, geo, the uh, geomagnetic pole, which is where particles can funnel into the Earth's atmosphere. Is that the issue? I'm not sure. Um, perhaps it could be the sun. We do know that when the sun gives off solar flares, it dumps more radiation into the Earth's environment, and we can detect more uh, radiation at high altitudes. So potentially something with a solar flare or just an active sun, or the fact that I was closer to the North Pole in Minnesota, I'm not, or the geo, geomagnetic North Pole in uh, Minnesota, I'm not sure which one it is. But it's still interesting to do an experiment, do a flight, even though you expect to get that need, because sometimes you can get something weird happening at higher altitudes that you don't expect. Uh, next slide. Uh, well, remember, this is 80,000 feet. Um, well, the funneling effect, though, is because if you look at the Earth, we've got the, the, the magnetic field of the Earth kind of comes into the geomagnetic North Pole. So our uh, Van Allen radiation belt we have surrounding the Earth, uh, the radiation that's trapped there can actually get closer to the North Pole, or excuse me, the geomagnetic North Pole. So possibly it's that we you get closer. In fact, I need to do this experiment someplace in Canada and see as I get closer to the geomagnetic North Pole, see if I get that spike happening at those, at those higher altitudes. Um, okay, so where do cosmic rays come from and where do you get the tremendous energies? We know that many of the low energy cosmic rays originate in the sun. We can look at this with the Earth, that the sun's 22 year solar cycle with solar flares, which are transient events or coronal mass ejections. We observe that those will, will increase the amount of cosmic rays we detect. So for the low energy cosmic rays, we know some of them are coming from the sun. We also know that the sun's magnetosphere changes over the 22 year uh, solar cycle, and that can block or affect or modulate cosmic rays entering from galactic space that actually enter into our solar system. But what are the sources of those cosmic rays? Well, physicists believe that in many cases they're supernova remnants. And the evidence for that? Well, earlier this year, the Fermi Space Telescope, this is a gamma ray telescope in orbit around the Earth, detected higher gamma ray emissions from younger supernova remnants, lower gamma ray emissions from older supernova remnants. The gamma rays are thought to be the result of subatomic particles being accelerated by shock waves inside the supernova remnant. Since younger supernova remnants have stronger shock waves, they should accelerate cosmic rays or particles within them to higher energies to turn them into cosmic rays. So what we're looking at is that we have atoms inside of the, of the supernova remnant, the shock wave, which occurs when matter moves faster than the speed of sound in that medium, has, uh, well, uh, when, when that subatomic particle passes through that shock wave, can be bounced off of that, picking up some energy. The stronger the shock waves and the more of them, the more the particles will bounce around between the, sh the shock waves, the boundaries of the shock waves, and the more energy they pick up until they can escape the supernova remnant. So when Fermi Space Telescope sees more cosmic or sees more gamma rays being emitted from younger supernova remnants, that's a sign that we are creating more and more powerful cosmic rays inside of those younger supernova remnants. So uh, the picture you saw earlier, the Crab Nebula, the reason I use that is that is a supernova, it's a very young supernova remnant. So some cosmic rays we're detecting here on Earth probably came from the Crab Nebula. But what about the highest the ultra-high cosmic rays. Well, there was, a, there was a cosmic ray observatory in Utah's Dugway Proving Ground in the 1980s called the Fly's Eye. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, but it would look at the sky at night. And they would look for the signature of cosmic rays entering into their atmosphere. Back in the 1980s or early 1990, 
They detected one cosmic ray. This is one subatomic particle carrying as much energy as a hard ball or a baseball thrown at 100 miles an hour. That's, so we're talking about a, a baseball that weighs, I don't know, a pound or something like that. That energy at 100 miles an hour in one subatomic particle. If you could get a thimble full of water and you could capture that cosmic ray within it, it would boil that water instantly. That's the, kind of amount, that's the amount of energy we're talking about in a single subatomic particle. The way it detects this is that the cosmic ray moves faster than the speed of light in a medium. So I'm not talking about in a vacuum, but if you're in the atmosphere, if you're in water, if you're in materials, the speed of light is a little bit slower. Light is forced to slow down. But cosmic rays can move faster than light can inside of a medium. And when they do that, they create what's called Shrenkoff radiation. The Shrenkoff radiation, you can think of it, it's basically a sonic, or a sonic boom, except it deals with electromagnetic radiation. So it's a photonic sonic boom, a photonic boom. Well, that looks at like a blue cone of light, and these detectors on the ground would look up using very large mirrors, five feet across, rubber detectors at the end. They would look up at the sky and look for that blue cone of light. And by using several of these detectors spread out looking at the sky, they can detect the streaks, the fluorescence, and the shrink off radiation given off by cosmic rays and determine their energies. So we're looking at cosmic rays with an energy of 10 to the 20th electron volts as the ultra high uh, cosmic rays. And that's what the flies I detected. And the question is, where does something like that come from? That's more powerful than they think that supernova remnants can create. Uh, another issue with that is that a, a cosmic ray moving with that much energy is going to collide with low energy photons of light in the universe. Remember when the Big Bang happened, we had this background radiation, it's now microwave radiation. A cosmic ray moving with that kind of energy is going to plow into those cosmic microwave background radiation. And when that happens, it's going to give up its energy. It'll give its energy to the photon of light, taking the microwave photon moving into a higher energy. A calculation has been made that says that a high energy cosmic ray of 10 to the 20th electron volts can only travel about 150 million light years before it hits enough microwave background radiation where it will lose its high energy status. And that limit is called, and I'll try to pronounce this the best I can, the grayson zatson Kuzman limit, or the GZK limit. That limit, GKZ limit is 150 million light years. So those ultra-high cosmic rays, energy cosmic rays that we're detecting, can come no further than 150 million light years. So what is within 150 million light years of Earth that could create those? Well, the OJ uh, Cosmic Ray Observatory in Argentina recently reported discovering a larger flux of these, of these high-energy uh, cosmic rays in the vicinity of galaxies that are known to have active nuclei. They're really bright. They have uh, large uh, black holes, the supermassive black holes in the center. Um, they're detecting more cosmic rays in the sky associated with the location of those, of those, um, those, gal of those types of galaxies, active galactic nuclei galaxies. Perhaps. The problem with that is that when cosmic rays move through space, they're going to be affected and deflected by magnetic fields in space. So if you see more cosmic rays coming from one location, that may not necessarily mean it comes from that location. They may have been in paths that were warped going through magnetic fields. It's only a statistical match. We need to do more, or they need to do more, more work to see if there really is a higher correlation of the direction of cosmic rays entering this atmosphere with these distant galaxies, with these active galactic nuclei. That's where the jury is still out. So the take home message from this is that the cosmic ray study is a relatively young field, less than 100 years old. The current known sources of cosmic rays are the sun and supernova explosions or supernova remnants. We know about those. Probable sources are probably very, are galaxies with very bright and active uh, nuclei that are less than 150 million light years away. And that the magnetic fields and shock waves within things like supernova remnants are probably accelerating these uh, cosmic rays up to their high energies. So when you detect a cosmic ray, so like when this click, this kind of goes off, we have detected an atom from another star and potentially from another galaxy. Did any questions or comments, anyone's experiences with cosmic rays or radiation? Mr. Andrews, the fellow that ran the Argentina site mm -hmm. the spring. Okay. Uh, the spring. Okay. And they're building a, another field that has 1,500 of these detectors out in Argentina. There's huge tanks of water yeah, in the Pampas. Yeah. And these buildings which have been looking up at the sky to see whether that affected the current 
Yes, yeah, showing cost radiation. They're going to build a 4,500 square kilometer array in Colorado, and some of the first things are already in because they need one in the northern hemisphere. That's right, because we need the south. That's right. So that's coming. That's going to be, and then the problem is that these really high energy cosmic rays, there might be one per square mile per century. Yeah. So you could have detectors that are hundreds of square miles across. You can't fill the land with those detectors. So you got to put these different detectors in different locations. Those water tanks work because a cosmic ray or high energy particle, any high energy particle, when it slams into the water, it's going faster than the speed of light in, that, in the water, and it will emit shrink off radiation that photo detectors can detect. Mm -hmm. Similar in uh, Utah, this, these flyby is mm -hmm. now being replaced with super flyby. Oh, okay. And uh, that, there are a variety of political issues and other issues that are slowing that uh, installation down. But when that comes online, it's to expect to move away and increase the resolution by about a quarter and a half of magnitude. Okay. <coughs> yeah, the flyby now, Dugway Proving Ground is a military site. The nice thing there is you're far away from cities, towns, houses. So the skies are really dark out there. So you deal with scorpions and stuff like that, but at least it's dark at night. Paul, so. oh. well, did you check that 09C flight you had that mm -hmm. had the increase above okay. Did you check the solar flare data? I flight? did not at the time. I need to go back and see if I can find something from previous. I need to see if there's a site that says back on these days. I had been several days before I actually got a chance to analyze the data, and it's like, what the? But, I, know, yeah. I know a group in North Dakota several years ago. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. That's right. Okay. So yeah, send up the Geiger count. Even like I said, even though you expect it to go down, send the Geiger count. I would like to do actually my experiment is I'd like to fly even if there's no solar flare, do some simultaneously from closer to the equator to closer to the North Pole and see if the profiles look the same. Because I don't know if that knee, the plot, how do you pronounce that word? Botsford. It occurs at 62,000. Does it occur at different altitudes? Different Geiger counters, different, different sensitivities. We may see differences in, in the, uh, the, that height based on the Geiger counter or based on your geomagnetic north latitude. Any other comments? Thank you.